preparing to live stream the meeting. You might be live right now. Um, if so, today we're meeting with Eric Ma. Um, hi, Eric. Hey, Matt. But that's actually really awkward hey, for me because Hugo told me to uh, to riff here for a while solo while he sets up and tweets about so, this message. Hi, everybody. <laughs> yep, I'm just posting posting this link to social, as we say. Um, but yeah, take it away, Matt and Eric. Well, I've got to like think of something to say now. Uh, Eric, who are you? All right. Hi, everybody. I'm I'm Eric. I work at the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. It's my day job. Um, over there, I'm what one canonically would call a data scientist, uh, though I think You're actually also a real scientist. So yeah, <laughs> that's that's true. I see myself first as like a scientist, then someone who can do computation, because that's actually the order of operations that happened in my life. I started out learning science, and then I learned computing later. Um, that's true for everyone over their 30s in science, I think. I think so. <laughs> that's right. Um, and so I, I do research right now that helps, uh, helps my colleagues at the bench, you know, make molecules that treat diseases a little bit faster. I, I, um, and one of the things that also has interested me since graduate school has been the thing that's going to be today's topic, which is protein science, because I've always found protein science to be like one of the more fascinating things about the world because proteins basically do almost everything. Your hair is a protein. Your skin is comprised of a ton of proteins. Proteins are the ones that digest other proteins. So it's like you got this yo dog situation over there. Um, yeah, so it's, it's really cool. And they're really the workhorse of much of biology. And that's what, that's what I'll be talking about today. So this is actually odd for me because I know you as Eric Ma who runs like several dozen tutorials every Python conference on data science, on Bayesian stuff, on network analysis, like they do all sorts, all sorts of things. Um, uh -huh. uh, you also happen to be a scientist, but like you are a fully active, fully engaged person in the Pinatic community. That's who, true. As and, a clone yeah. doing science is my understanding. And I understand that today we're talking to the clone of Eric that happens to be <laughs> <That's> a <clone. laughs> That's true. And I think that the reason why I like to do the tutorials is because I'm learning myself. And so the best way to learn is to teach. And the best way to, the dumbest student that you can ever teach is your computer, because your computer will do exactly the thing you tell it to do. And if it doesn't do what you tell it to do, it means you haven't learned. <laughs> if it doesn't do exactly what you expect the result to be, um, doesn't produce that result, that means the teacher has a problem. So that's, that's uh, part of the motivation there. Sounds great. Hugo. Hello, oh, everyone. Requisite hours done. Great. Absolutely. And I just wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, we've got Daniel Chen in the chat. We've got Scott Barnett, James Bobo, uh, Stoney Vincent. Um, it would be fantastic to say where you're, where you're dialing in from, uh, what you're interested in, where you work, uh, what you like to do. Um, Daniel Chen has very kindly wished me a happy birthday. Um, and I appreciate that so much, Daniel. I've, I've birthday, missed you very man. much this year. Thank you, Matt. Um, and the funny thing, of course, it is, it is my birthday where you all are in, um, but I'm in the future currently. So yesterday was my birthday in, in Australia, but it's nice to have kind of the after effect, the glow, let's say the long tail of my birthday. Um, and there are lots of people in the, in, in the chat in here who, who I, who I very much miss, including, uh, Matt and, and Eric that we'd usually see each other at SciPy or on the conference circuit this year. Um, uh, Scott Barnett um, asked if I'm 29 again, and time time definitely does fly. Um, if you can guess my age, um, let's have a contest where you get to have dinner with Matt. No, I'm kidding. That's not a genuine genuine <laughs> genuine offer. Daniel Chen has also written. Uh, Wait a minute. If I'm here, who's there on on YouTube? Uh, which is which is Eric Ma and Eric and I discussed this re recently. Um, how on the conference circuit. People will get uh, Daniel and, and Eric mixed up uh, quite, quite often. Um, what's, what's a differentiating factor, Eric? Um, Dan Chen walks around with a snorkel in his glasses. <laughs> it's so <laughs> true. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Um, so uh, Stoney has asked, is this uh, similar 
to what uh, Sebastian Rajka did with potential uh, pheromone receptor binding for physical experiments, such as the binding affinity for ACE2 with the current virus uh, of interest? What a great question. Is that a great question? We're getting ahead of ourselves there. We got to like, you know, take baby steps first. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll, we'll we'll get there unless Eric has a has a twenty second answer to that. Yes no, or no? Actually, we'll get there. Okay, fantastic. Um, great to see you, Pablo. Calling in from Chicago, uh, data scientist, building products, uh, man manufacturer. Really cool. So I think. Um, we may as well jump in as we do with each each session here. I'd I'd love to ask Matt just to give us a brief intro into what what Dask actually is. I think I should just defer that to Eric. You ask me that every week, uh, Hugo, and I want to get to other people to give that, that same answer. Uh, sure, I I can try. Um, I I see Dask as like the tool that lets one data scientist scale out to all of our data. So I've used Dask as a, as sort of part of the toolkit for scaling up projects. And the best part is I scale up, scale up the project without really needing to change my tooling. The prior to, prior to doing, you know, parallelization in a notebook, you would uh, sort of drop out of a Jupyter notebook, drop into your cluster submission context, write a bash script that submits a bash script that executes another Python script that then writes out to the file system, right? Like it's another one of those yo dog situations. Um, so what Dask allows me to do instead is never drop out of the notebook. And in fact, not dropping out of the notebook is so important for productivity because we know that switching contexts, you lose all the momentum that you used to have. And when I switch from a notebook to a terminal, that's already a context switch of some kind. Um, so a lot of momentum gets lost. So Dask lets me, gives me superpowers effectively. Um, and I've actually done projects at work where, you know, the prototypes were all easy to do in memory on a single core. And then I just had to write a simple for loop to scale it out to the entire realm of data at NIBR. And bingo, I was done, one data scientist. And that's where the that's where the power really goes. You don't have to map reduce over people, you map reduce over compute cores, which is which is what I really appreciate about Dask. Could you tell us what NIBA is? Uh, NIBA is the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research. It's where I work. Fantastic. So that was a great introduction to Dask. I'll say a bit about what we do at Coiled. We're building products uh, on on top of Dask and on top of the Pi Data Stack that help data science teams scale their data science and machine learning to larger data and, and larger models as well. And we'll see what that means in a second. Um, I'd, I'd love to encourage if any questions pop up, um, please post them in the chat as, as soon as possible because we want this to make this as interactive uh, as possible. Um, but without further ado, I'm just gonna share my screen to talk a bit about who uses Dask and what we, what we talk about and how we do and how we think about distributed uh, data science in, in general. Okay, so. Um, just uh, let me know when you can see my screen, Eric and or Matt. I can see it. So I really just want to say a few words about who uses Dask, because I have uh, at the start of most of these, these sessions, um, a handful of cases. It really is used wherever Python is used and wherever the PyDathan uh, stack is used, um, which as you know, is everywhere. And we see it in life sciences, in retail, such as Walmart, finance, uh, geophysical sciences, uh, among many others. Um, handful of examples. This is some great work uh, by uh, Tally Lambert at uh, Harvard, Harvard Medical School. Uh, and as you see here, Tally has said ex explicitly that Dask uh, lets him prototype pipelines on his laptop and scale easily to his institution compute cluster. Um, and one of the big selling points is the fact that it mimics common APIs and that that makes it makes adopting it nearly eff effortless. And this speaks to, um, you know, there are several technical goals of Dask, but it speaks to a social goal of Dask, which was to invent nothing or as, as little as possible. So people who are using, who are using PyData um, can, can jump in as e easily as possible. And, I'm actually not yeah. seeing the slideshow change. Eric, can you see the slideshow change? Eric, do you see Hugo changing slides or no? Uh, no, I actually don't. Uh, I see. Oh. 
I see just his his screen. Well, is moving around, but yes. uh, it's how about now? Desk. How does it look now? It looks like the uh, Google Slides editor right now. It does. Uh, okay. I love the exclamation point in front of, after Science Thursdays, though. I'm a big fan of exclamation points. There. Now we're seeing the the slide change. Okay. So what I'll do is I won't share my screen. I, I mean, I won't uh, yeah. share the the presentation at at large, but I'll I'll do it in in, in the browser here. Looks so, great. fantastic. This is a beautiful image that Tel Telly Lambert has has generated. And as I said, um, you know, Dask lets Tally, along many other people, among many other people, prototype pipelines on laptop and scale easily to the institution's compute cluster. Um, I'll, I'll just add that Eric spoke to the idea that Dask can let you work natively from your Jupyter notebook, um, and that really speaks to the same point of the interoperability of Python and the, the Pi data stack in general. And one way I like to think about it is it helps you kind of stay in your flow state of scientific research. So, and Eric spoke to mm -hmm. it nicely in terms of, um, you know, no need to context, context shift um, so that you can actually stay in, in, in that flow state and iterate and, and prototype and productionize as, as quickly as possible. Um, this is a slide that we showed the past couple of weeks um, that is deeply relevant today because it's, um, one of uh, concerns Eric uh, and his work at, uh, at NIBA. And what Eric said is that, I'm gonna quote Eric to Eric, that Dask helps us scale up machine learning prototypes. And that's precisely what we're gonna see today. So I would um, normally end here, um, but what I'm going to do, oh, this is hilarious. There's a somehow um, an, an image missing on this slide. So that's that's prob slightly problematic. But what I, wanna, what I wanted to say is when we're talking about machine learning at scale, for, for example. And this is from Tom Augsburger's uh, talk at PyData NYC last year. There are really, a lot of people I think are under the misapprehension that distributed compute and, and, and Dask is mostly useful when you have really large data sets that, you know, for out of core computing or don't fit in, in, in memory, okay? Um, and so that's the RAM bound uh, case. And we see that you get that when you increase data size here along the X axis. But there's also model size and you run up against um, CPU boundness, right? Um, and you see that with large ensemble models uh, such as random forest with many trees or large hyperparameter optimization. And that's exactly uh, the case we're gonna see today uh, with, with, with Eric's work, okay? Um, so the way, you know, one way that Tom likes to think about it, this, there are many solutions. Um, choose a simpler model, uh, more parallelization by buying a bigger machine. Um, or more parallelization by distributed computation with Dask. And we're gonna see uh, the third one of these today. Um, well, that's definitely uh, enough out of me. If you have any questions about that, please do uh, ask them in, in the chat and we'll get to them. But I would love to, for us to jump in and, and see Eric's work uh, now. And just for a bit more context, um, we're gonna discuss the, a brief introduction to the machine learning challenge and talk about some pre-processing. Then we're gonna jump into a, some really cool featureization. Um, and then we're gonna build, so, see some machine learning uh, models using random forests and, and Dask ML, which I'm really excited about. So without further ado, take it away, Eric. Cool. All right, thanks, Hugo. <clears throat> I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, what I'm gonna show you uh, actually, I got, I got one thing, one other thing to share. It, it's on the slide deck that I did for a science meeting this morning. Everything that I'm going to show you actually started by browsing Twitter at work. So I'm not saying that you, I encourage browsing Twitter at work, but it's, it's pretty good for Monte Carlo inspiration. Um, there was this paper that got published, and it's um, the melting points of a whole bunch of proteins across 13 species of life. So this is like the global proteome stability or the meltome atlas. And when I was back then, back then in April, like this came out on April 25th, and I saw the tweet on April 26th during the day, and I was thinking, well, <clears throat> we've been concerned with protein stability. Let me go check this paper out and see what we can learn from it. What I soon learned was that uh, they gave us uh, a, a data dump that I could download. And that's sort of where the starting point of everything I'm going to show is to show today. So I'm just going to drag this back off to the side because uh, it's not relevant anymore. I just wanted to share that. 
Okay. Thank you. So that's cool. Um, so that's a little bit of the mo motivation. And one of the one of the tasks that's pretty common, uh, you'll see it all over the place, is prediction of protein something from protein sequence. And why is this important? It's because sequences are cheap and easy to obtain. And so they're as a primary representation of a protein, they're pretty they're pretty easy to cheat to gather. You can sequence proteins, uh, you can sequence the genome of an organism to get protein sequences. You can order DNA that then gets expressed into a live protein, like an enzyme that cleaves stuff. And what's of interest is properties of a protein. And we know that the relationship between the property of a protein and the sequence is well known in biology as a sequence function relationship. Uh, so the primary sequence of a protein is like super easy to cheat and cheap to obtain, but properties are expensive to, to, to measure. So just for contrast, um, most of say ad tech retail tech world, they talk about big data on the scale of like billions of measurements coming in every single day. For us um, to be able to get a thousand really well characterized melting points over four weeks, involving expensive reagents, three or four lab scientists, that's, that's large. That's pretty large for us. It's not about the, the terabytes of data that we get. It's not terabytes of data. These are like kilobytes of data that are extremely exp expensive to measure. And so it's important because if we're trying to optimize some property of a protein, may not be melting point, could be enzyme activity, we can't afford to be able to uh, synthesize lots and lots and lots and lots of proteins and measure them at the scale of uh, n to the power of 20, where n is the number of uh, positions in a protein and 20 is the number of possible amino acids per position. You can't. So machine learning holds its promise in that it should allow us to learn the sequence activity or yeah, sequence function relationship a little bit more easily from from observational data and thereby help us navigate sequence space or sequence function space in a little bit more principled and faster fashion. And there's some things at work that we've done to show that this is potentially possible contingent on, of course, some other things. So melting points are important because they relate to the stability of a protein. And the stability of a protein, if it's, for example, a therapeutic agent and you need to ship it from North America or Europe where it's being manufactured across the Atlantic to some other place. Um, you have to cold chain it uh, in, in ice packs and the likes. And so being able to engineer greater thermal stability, that is to say being able to raise the melting point of a protein has some really practical applications. Right, so I thought, well, let's, let's try to do some prototyping uh, none of this, by the way, that I'm going to show you as a production system. This is all extremely big prototypes. Um, big. That's, that's wonderful context, Eric. Thank you. And yeah. I'll, I'll just add that we're not making, Eric's not making these notebooks available yet because he's planning to publish on this. But after the fact, um, he'll, he'll do so. And um, right. I'll share a form at the end. And if you'd like us to send them notebooks to you and the publication, we can, we can do so. And you can give us your email address. So. Cool. Thanks, Hugo. Matt, did you have something? I want to. I want to. Uh, whenever I hear something, you said a bunch of terms I didn't really understand. So I want to try to say it back to you. Make sure that I yeah. get it. So I, I, when you said terabytes and kilobytes, my like brain turned on. That's what I think about usually. So you say kilobytes as like you know a few thousand uh, terms, you know letters or something that might correspond to some amino acid. Yeah. And each of those things might be in some different orientation, right? And based on those orientations, that protein will survive or not survive. If it gets hot. That's right. The, the, yeah. the order of letters, basically. Right. So we want to sort of search that space to find things that won't melt. Uh, That's right. So that they can be shipped more effectively. Right. That's so, one potential uh, application. That's right. Okay. Um, so really, like you just have a few thousand letters and flop them around, and you have some function that looks each of those flopped around positions and see how, how, how it works. Uh, that's. Like, that's that's kind of it. So, so now a protein will, will go from its string of letters into like a string of amino acids, and then it'll fold up and whatever. 
but determining the, the fold of the protein and like how the, each of the amino acids interact with each other is also an expensive measurement. So determining 3D structure from, from sequence is also like a really hard task. Um, but for today, it's just going to be given protein sequence, tell me what the melting point of that protein should be. Um, and that one has applications in like production of an enzyme or a production of a therapeutic protein, sorry, or stability of a protein when it's like inside the vat being produced, for example. Um, so I'm going to give a little bit of introduction to a little bit of my workflow just so that there's some stuff that's there. Dan Chen, who is on the line, should probably be really happy seeing this. I recommend you check this out. He just wrote, yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, so I have a habit as a data scientist of trying to impose some kind of a sane structure on my uh, project directory. So notebooks are all kept in one place. Data are call all kept in one place. Pickled bottles and outputs of PyMC3 are kept in one place. Scripts are kept in one place. And that just, that just makes things a little bit more sane. Um, you don't want to see what this directory looked like this morning before I cleaned it up. It was actually quite horrible. There were notebooks in the same directory as the CSV files, in the same directory as the pickle files. It's no good. It, it makes it really intimidating. And when you go to the notebooks directory, there's like numbering for the important notebooks and just prototype notebooks don't get anything. I think it's a really important thing that we pick up good data science workflow. And Dask, by the way, if you're trying to scale things out, it's part of that good data science workflow toolkit. Now, apart from having a trying to impose a sane data, uh, sane structure, I've also seen notebooks that in which there are these extremely long data loading functions and data cleaning functions. That's horrible for reading the notebook after the fact. In fact, when I came back to my original notebooks four weeks after first trying this, like I was intimidated by my own work. Um, and a way to sort of abstract it out is to be able to write your own software libraries or at least writing uh, a something.py that lives inside the same notebooks. I usually have the habit of actually going a little bit more fancy and creating like a source directory here and like pip installing uh, into the environment that this project lives. But because this is right now in my scratch environment, I haven't done anything more than that. I'm just going with a common.py that I can import directly into the notebooks. Even that is better than not having, having anything. And so, this is something refactoring code is something you and I have talked about many times in private and in public before, particularly for, you know, I think principal that, data science workflows. I got to say though, Eric, I am so itching to jump into machine learning and I'm sure our audience is as well. So we could, we could riff, for, I mean, we probably should talk about version control and unit testing as well at some point, but <laughs> yes. We should not do enough, that. Not enough minutes in the hour. I know, I know. So in a moment, you're going to see all of this uh, show up again, and it's going to be pretty exciting. For the time being, though, I'm going to do a risky thing, restart and clear out the notebook and try oh, to get whoa, everything whoa, whoa. from um, scratch. It's going to okay. be good. It's going My to be heart good. rate just went up. <laughs> Let's see what happens with this. So. First thing that we're going to do is we're going to load some data. I know what the semantic meaning of this data frame is, so I'm, uh, I'm going to leave it at that. But it looks something like this, right? Um, basically, what we've got is we've got uh, the organism in which our protein lives, its protein ID, its gene name, so we can actually search for it in the public databases, an experimentally determined melting point. Um, and those are the relevant ones. I also went in beforehand, because I knew we probably might not have enough time for this. I went in beforehand <clears throat> and pulled down every single protein sequence that I could find for each of these proteins that are in the data set. Um, from that, uh, next thing that we're going to do is a habitual thing of mine. If I know I'm going to go and do some scaled out work, um, we're going to create a Dask cluster. This DAS cluster lives on our high performance computing system. And let me just see if I, I can get this out here. Um, oh, that, it, it, was, um, it was a little bit not so happy. There we go. Uh, 
So we got our workers up and running. So it's, it's we, we run Dask on our high performance computing system internally. And one of the reasons why I like it is, is, is because I have a, an extremely fluctuating software development environment. So if, especially if I have like a full on source library, that source code is uh, changing all the time because I'm adding functionality, deleting functionality, um, and I need those changes to be reflected in real time on all of our DAS workers. And that's what allows, uh, so we've got a, a shared file system that allows that to happen. So we don't need this. Let's just take a look at that guy. So client is up and running. We've got all 200 workers. I've asked for 16 gigs per worker, so that's really cool. I, I, I get to commandeer 3.2 terabytes of RAM for myself um, in a bursty fashion, which is kind of nice, right? Like, it, you, yeah. you don't have to get Pardon me, Matt? I'm really impressed at how quickly your machine gave you that, those, that, that many workers. Oh, also, yeah. You see, yeah. That's it's like a queue. You got to wait for a few minutes at least, and you just got those immediately. And now, yeah. Are that's right. Um, I think one of the nice things our scientific computing team did uh, was to actually go in and give us uh, a refreshed batch of hardware just last year. So our productivity has just gone up. I have to give a big shout out to them. Um, and of so course, Eric, something we've discussed is using HPC is, is great, but if you can't get enough access to it or you get throttled and you need to burst to the cloud, that's oh, when, yeah. when you get some real challenges, um, which yeah, of course right. are challenges that we're, we're working to solve at, at Coil. Exactly. And there are times when, you know, legitimately, there are other computation groups that need this bandwidth because, so for example, the sequencing group might be up there sequencing lots of samples in their bioinformatics pipelines have to occupy a good fraction of cores. Or for example, the um, molecular modeling groups, uh, they might be paralyzing some of their CUDA enabled um, uh, molecular dynamics simulations. And gosh, those like really, really clutter up the, the, the cluster. Um, I love it so when you speak CUDA to me, Eric. I also just want to note, Chen, Dan Chen just wrote in the chat, Eric is the machine, which is <laughs> something I'm going to quote him on for, for years to come. OK, let's keep going. OK. All right. Um, so one thing we're going to do to deal with protein sequences. So protein sequences come to us as letters. Um, we have to find a numerical representation for them. Uh, so one of the things that one of our interns found was actually this model this recurrent neural net model called Jack's UniRep. It was originally implemented in TensorFlow, but it was really slow in TensorFlow. So we went in and rewrote it in Jax um, and sort of made it 100 times faster on CPU. And so now we use it as part of our own protein ML toolkit. So I'm going to just- a 100 times faster? Yeah, we got, we got benchmarks. To, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, that wasn't, yeah, we just made it 100 times faster. Great. <laughs> so. Um, let's, so even then though, like it's a, it's a recurrent neural net, right? So it's, it's going to take a little bit of time to, to run its thing. Um, so what we did was we wrote it up as a, we rewrote the model and then packaged it up and sort of tried to spruce up the API. This is another paper we're trying to get out, like a software paper. I really like software papers, by the way. Um, so you might submit it to one of the chem informatics or the JOS journal. Um, so we're going to do the get reps function, which will give us a 1900 long vector per protein sequence. That's the most important, important thing here. So let's just see how long this takes. Usually it's taken on the order of seven to 10 seconds. We'll see what it's like here. Uh, and it might take a little bit of time. That's okay. This is when we get to sort of feel the slowness. Yeah. Even this already feels a little too, too, too slow for me. I'm not used to that. Okay. So it'll take about nine seconds, uh, give or take. And if we try to calculate the number of hours we'll need to do this for all proteins that are inside that data set, it would be about eight hours or so. So that's clearly unreasonable. That would have been like th those things that in the old days, I would have just gone, I'd set this up at the end of the day, no go way. home, and then you know come back later, but now, now it's we live in different times. So I've got a Dask cluster up and running, and we're just going to submit the function to the Dask cluster. 
there are two progress bars that you have to keep in mind here. The first progress bar is the time that it takes to submit every single protein to the get reps function. And then this, this progress bar already makes me happy because you know waiting seven seconds for stuff is too long. So knowing the progress is great. But the real progress bar that makes me really happy is this progress bar. Um, and this progress bar gives me a real time update on you know, what, what's going on on the cluster. So this is really cool for and just tell out. us a bit about that beautiful dashboard as well, Eric. There's, there's uh, a lot happening there. I, I feel like I should defer this to Matt. <laughs> that's I love fair. it. <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let's see, what are we saying? So uh, the upper right plot, oh, sorry, the upper left, right? So bytes stored. So we've got a couple hundred machines and we're looking at how much RAM is on each of those machines is being used. Um, it's actually odd because we're seeing very small amounts of data, right? So indeed, your pieces of data are very, very small, Eric. You've yeah. got probably hundreds of these things on each machine, and they're taking up 500 kilobytes total. Uh, on the bottom, actually, my screen hooked up there. Uh, yeah, the number of tasks processing on each machine. So how much, how much is sort of each machine waiting in their in their pipeline in their queue? Let me see that mm -hmm. it's, it's mostly uniform towards the bottom with a couple of stragglers on the end. Mm -hmm. um, the upper right plot is showing us the activity per core. So this is actually something we've been talking about a lot in Dask. This plot stops making sense when you have more than like 50 workers. Um, mm -hmm. We're just kind of saying that like yellow stuff is happening. Uh, yeah. I'm, so like we should sort of figure out how, how to make this visualization more scalable in the future. Mm -hmm. right? um, then the bottom we got a progress bar, which is you know showing about halfway done. Oh, good. I'm one curious. thing I go ahead. One thing I kind of like is the fact that um, I can hover over and see what the characters of time in seconds per per task is. Right, but like you should be able to tell you that information in like a summary plot. You shouldn't have to sample yourself. We should give you a distribution oh. of, of the average time. Um, That's right. And there are actually like new plots that give you that kind of information. Okay. Um, I'm curious, that, what is happening inside of each of those little yellow rectangles? Is that taking one of those sequences of letters and determining if it is going to melt or not? Is that no? This is actually the protein vectorization step or the, mm -hmm. the step in which we take the protein sequence and convert it into a 1900 long vector. Okay. And that's that's what's happening right now, uh, and even that step, you know, already takes quite a lot of time. Right. So this is just pre-processing. So the... Pardon me, Matt. So this is just pre-processing right now. We're just taking this that text data, we're mapping it to some space, getting out some numeric data, and we've yes. got more after this. Yes, that's right. That's, that's and it's creating we're... creating important features, right, Eric? Is that that's a right. way to think about it? That's right. So the recurrent neural network was actually trained on um, twenty five million. Pre-trained, sorry, pre-trained neural network uh, that some guys at the uh, research group, sorry, at uh, the church lab at Harvard Medical School did. Um, it was trained on 25 million protein sequences that represent pretty much all of known protein science, protein sequence space. Um, and the weights are pre-trained. So that means I thankfully don't have to do their two week on GPU on AWS <laughs> training protocol. Uh, we can, we packaged, we have the we have the weights. Uh, you, know, you can download them from AWS. They provide the link for that, and uh, we use we leverage those weights to uh, do the featureization. So this it, it's a recurrent neural net that knows something about global protein sequence space, uh, where global is defined as all known protein sequences that are publicly available. Great. We have a couple of questions from Stony that we can answer now or, or defer slightly. But um, um, are your coworkers' uh, workloads most? Uh, do they mostly compute constrained and have small size data inputs? Um, are they mostly compute? Yeah, exactly. They are mostly comp they are totally compute constrained, right? And it is small data. Your ResNet yeah. is doing inference and has already been trained. Is a question. Oh wait, ResNet. Yes. I think you're just saying your model has already been trained. And that's what you're talking yeah. about before. This is the pre-trained, we're using a pre-trained model. Yeah. Uh, right, right, yes. Uh, we're, I'm, I'm using a pre-trained model, that's right. This is, this is not the ResNet model, just so we're clear. It's yeah. 
uni rep model, but yeah. okay. Thing. Thank you. Um, and there's a another technical question from Sony. Do you need to? And I don't quite get this, but you may. Do you need to rotate and normalize the vector space to compare it to the previous computing computed embeddings? Um, rotate and normalize. Um, the the rotation piece I don't get, but uh, normalization is typically not something that we end up doing in for for the recurrent neural net, um, and the reason is because uh, one um, we use we use the features that are computed as if it were the penultimate layer of a CNN, right? So it's a it's a representation, a learned representation of protein space or this for, for UniRep's case versus a uh, um, learned representation of images in say a ResNet or a CNN, classic CNN case. Okay, so right. that's, that's how we're using this right now. So therefore okay. normalization, we don't really bother because I'm going to end up using tree-based models on top of this. That's helpful. Let's, let's move on. Stony has some more technical questions, which I think are very interesting, but in order to get through what we want, to, what we need to, we can't really delve into all these de details now. Um, yeah. But let's, let, let's keep moving on. But thank you for your great questions, Stony. Yeah, absolutely. That, those, that's really cool. I'm happy to talk more offline. So what happens awesome. afterwards now is we've got our, uh, all of our proteins computed as vectors now, represented as vectors, just as a quick test, making sure that the shape is correct. It's, it's really important. Um, as we learned while re-implementing the neural network in JAX, if you, you can actually have correctly shaped tensors that are semantically incorrect and you'll get all the wrong things out of it. Um, it's really horrible. <laughs> so what we're gonna do next is um, over here, because this function feels like something we might end up using over and over, uh, especially when we're doing dealing with splits of our data, and especially if later on we have to do special types of splitting. So one of the goals of this paper that we're trying to write is that we want to do augmentation of our input and uh, augmentation of our data in a way that doesn't just involve slapping out Gaussian distributions with fixed variance on the Y, right? Like that doesn't sound principled. So what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to say, well, let me simulate what uh, replicates of replicate measurements will look like. And that comes all from Bayesian estimation behind the scenes, which I'm not even showing right now. Um, and so having special splitting functions to make sure that we don't have replicates that show up in the train set and the test set is extremely important. So that's why I have this, uh, this function that does like make features, and it'll do what it, it'll do the all So the right, just, just quickly, would you then refer to this as some form of Bayesian deep learning? No, no, okay. this is a uh, data augmentation. The, the real Use story it. behind it is data augmentation uh, okay. through statistical estimation. Right. Um, it's something that I really want to see happen because I think we're not going to get better models until we know how to leverage uh, proper, properly estimated Bayesian statistical uncertainty to then augment our data. It's like really cool in my head. Um, awesome. And I have preliminary results that I don't, that is like way at the bottom of the notebook that will, that sort of hints that all of this is possible. That's not the point of today. Today is all about DAS. So uh, I'm just gonna do a few more joins just for the thing that I want, which is, to create this table called Basilisk Bayesian. And what I'm trying to do here is create a table that has not only the point estimate from uh, the original uh, melting point from the original author's uh, statistical estimation procedure, but a Bayesian estimated melting temperature that comes from uh, using the exact same equations, but putting a hierarchical Bayesian model on top of all of, at, on top of the uh, rewriting as a hierarchical Bayesian model. And what that affords for me is the ability to actually get um, melting points imputed 
and estimated that are kind of reasonable for proteins that don't have uh, a melting point by the original estimation procedure. That in itself is already an augmentation over the original uh, protocol. So I'm gonna get that in. Oh, did I? Crap, I, I reran it, sorry. There we go. Um, I might have actually, should not have done this. Uh, I wanna be able to use the estimated one. Oh, well, crap, there's a little bit of a problem. I, some of the proteins might have been missing a protein sequence, and so I need to I need to fix that. But in any case, the scale of the, the data, joys of live coding. I know joys of live coding. Uh, there are supposed to be some rows that have a null in the melt point, so my bad. In any case, we're dealing with not so much data compared to the original, um, but you know we're we're still going to end up taking a little bit of time to fit a model on a single core. So. Uh, I'm gonna try this with Dask, where I'm gonna like fit a model for doing. Great, and, and this is, now we're gonna see the distributed random forest. Is that what we're gonna jump into? That's right. Awesome. We do our Using standard, Dask ML. Standard splitting. Um, this should run relatively, oh, did I forget to run that? I must have forgotten to run that. Yes. And that. Okay, live coding joys. Uh, this should run relatively quickly. And that's because make features is uh, leveraging the fact that there are features that already exist for some of those sequences, so you don't have to recompute them. Uh, this all belongs to the realm of tests that Matt and I were doing before we started, before we went live. So I'm just gonna cut them and skip right past it. So this is, this is where um, Dask really shines. Um, Dask ML, sorry, really shines. And this is because uh, we're able to parallelize trivially parallelizable machine learning algorithms. Like random forest is completely trivially parallelizable. And so I'm just going to run it. And it should show up shortly over here. Yeah, that's really And cool. this is the same thing we see over and over again that you. You're writing your scikit-learn code and then using Dask in, in the backend to parallelize yeah, over right. all these models, right? And if we did this on a single core, this is like three seconds each over 200 trees, that's about 600 seconds. It would be like a 10 minute, 10 minute wait, right? No. Now I just don't have time to make coffee, I guess. Um, you also only used like a small fraction of your machine, I think, right? You had 200 workers each with a few cores, is that right? No, I, I usually go for, as a habit, uh, oh. try to be a nice citizen. I ask for one core per, okay. per worker, just to be kind of a nice citizen on, on the internal HPC. So okay. let's see how it goes. You probably see the plot below. This is from a previous run. It's going to be a kind of a crappy model. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a crappy model. And this is, just so you all know, this is sort of par for the course in terms of like how good our models can be, our machine learning models can be when it comes to predicting chemical versus predicting and, and predicting protein properties. Um, and so one of the reasons why I wanted to be able to do- and I'm, uh, I'm sorry, Eric, just to stop you. This, this figure is predicted melting oh, point yes. Yes, versus sorry. actual right. melting point. Yeah, let's, um, let's be a good scientist. Um, PLT. Label your, label your axes. Yeah, that's right. Actual Brilliant. and PLT.Y label model prediction. There we go. Um, and so this is, this is just so you all know, this is like really part of the course. Most models fall within this regime of, let's see, what is the R square and mean squared error? So the R square score, which is a measure of like the variance over of the error versus the area variance of the uh, data in scikit-learn. Um, this is about 0.2, so you know the variance of the error. Errors occupy about 80% of the variance of the data, which is like about there. I used to expect that uh, models should go to like you know R square 0.9, you know R square 0.85, right? That that scale. Then then a colleague from the chemistry group um, chimed in and said, "Yeah, most of your models are going to have R square of 0.0, .0. and then some will be negative, and then a few will be at 0.5." 
the really good performing ones are at 0.5. There's a lot of noise that goes from sequence to function that are not modeled by knowing the uh, protein sequence. So like the, the protein lives in a buffer. So what if the buffer concentration fluctuates on that day? Um, what if the hands of the experimenter did something? What if the oxidation levels, oxygen levels were a little high, so something got oxidized? That affected protein function. Those are all stuff you can't model from sequence. Um, those are all external factors. So anyways, this is, this is what we got. My hope with augmentation with Bayesian um, estimated posterior distributions is we can inject replicates uh, at the extremes where the modeling is no good and hopefully sort of sh uh, shift the distribution of predicted versus actual closer to the y equals x line. So we add more data out here where the prediction is bad. We add more data out here where also the prediction is bad. Let's see. I, I have, I'm not sure whether this will work in every single case, and that's why, I, that's why we do research. Um, that's, uh, otherwise, it'd just be called search, right? Um, and so that's a thing, that's a thing that uh, we're, we're looking at right now. And that's sort of the main point of the whole exercise with melting points. It just turned out to be a really convenient source of data that I could use uh, that I could like test this idea on. Cool. And, and that sort of ends my demo here. There's more down below. Uh, there's probabilistic machine learning models that we've been trying out and I want to see whether they improve. Uh, our estimates of uncertainty in the prediction, um, if they can also improve the expect expected value that we see. Right? So can we shift, does a probabilistic model help shift this up or does it not really? So those are like all questions we're trying to answer in an empirical fashion, of course. All right, Hugo, that's it. That's, uh, that's the demo. Thank and you so, this so much for walking labor. us through this, Eric. Um, if we have any questions in, in, in the chat, we'd be happy to answer them. Um, I, I think um, Matt has just linked to a to a GitHub issue, which which he, he might want to mention also. No, there was uh, there were some jokes uh, in the in the chat while you were running the big problems bar, which is that the dash dash would have a little audible ding when it finishes, which would be very. Oh, yeah. And then Matthias actually, uh, so Anderson made that made the joke. Matthias actually said ding, and there's actually has been a proposal uh, about sonifying the dashboard. Uh, I think possibly for accessibility reasons, but also just for fun. Mm. Uh, but I had a question for you, Eric, or a comment, yeah. really. Uh, this is, I like that all of the actual complicated stuff that you did here had nothing to do with Dask. Like you use Dask mm -hmm. in very boring ways to mm -hmm. like take some fancy Jacks thing you wrote and run it lots of times, or like take second learn yeah. and in a forest. Yeah. But in between, like you totally skipped over a bunch of like complicated pandas code. We were joining and querying interesting data sets together. You totally yes. skipped over like how you use Jax. Um, and that's, that's actually really satisfying. I think this is a great example of how if you uh, give someone just access to a big distributed machine, they can use it to reduce all the really time consuming parts, yes. even when it's really boring, especially. When yes. Yes, absolutely. I hear you on that, Matt. It's like, one of, uh, and actually for me, that has been the majority use case, which has been kind of really boring, but extremely time consuming tasks uh, that I can interactively map reduce rather than jumping out to some other context. And I know some people will ask like, why don't you use Spark, right? Um, and I think one of the reasons why I did not use Spark earlier on, this is, uh, this is not a ding on Spark, this is just a personal preference, right? One of the reasons I didn't use Spark early on is because the APIs didn't really match 100% the way like Dask and other PyData projects had these like um, API policies that said, we're, we're just gonna target scikit-learn. We're just gonna target pandas. We're just gonna target NumPy. They're idiomatic, enough people use it. We shouldn't try to be smart and invent a slightly incompatible API, which is the worst if you do a slightly incompatible API. So yeah, that's, that, that was one of the reasons why I, I jumped. I agree with that rationale completely. And I'll, I'll build on that by saying that for the most part, once again, when you're using Dask for data frames, for example, it actually runs pandas code for the most part in, in, in the backend. So your mental model of the code you're writing is actually what's, what's happening also. Um, yeah, that's right. Which I think is testament to Dask's role in the, in, in the PyData stack. Um, Dan Chen had a, had a great question. Uh, he 
he states that random forests uh, fit multiple. Uh, random forest uh, fits multiple trees. Was the job lib backend equal to Dask all you need to to do this in, in to split uh, each tree in random forest? Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's all I had to add. So instead of writing model, instead of writing line four followed directly by line six, I add line five, and then I fit. And that's like how you. That's that's how software should be developed. Mm. There was, um, I think someone mentioned, like they, someone called this Dask ML. This actually isn't in the Dask ML library. The Dask mm -hmm. ML library has a bunch of other things in it. This is mm -hmm. just straight scikit-learn. So the scikit-learn devs added Dask support with their job. Right. Um, so you need to have fancy Dask ML things. This is just baked right in. Mm -hmm. And I think that was me that said it was Dask ML. So I... I wasn't going to say anything, Hugo, but uh, yeah, went out yourself. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, Fantastic. So I'll once again re remind people we've I've, I've posted uh, Coiled has posted a form in, in in the chat. We would love feedback on, on these sessions. Uh, what what you enjoyed, what you think we could improve on, um, and who you'd like to see uh, here in in the future. That that would be that, that would be amazing. Um, but unless uh, either Matt or Eric have um, some final words, uh, we we can wrap up. I think one of the things that you know we, we did talk a little bit about the the burst of the cloud piece earlier on, and I think there's like a thing to be said about how hard it is to be able to to burst the cloud from say an HPC system, especially under the circumstance where I have an evolving code base. Um, so, for example, I write a bunch of functions, and all of those functions depend on other functions inside the code base, and yeah. I want to be able to parallelize the the leaf function, right? There's this graph of function calls and I have to go right to the leaf. I will parallelize that one. I need my remote compute to be able to know the entire stack of functions that is being called up, up above. Mm -hmm. And um, with most other parallelization systems uh, that are being vendored right now, it seems to me that they, they just don't think about that use case, right? Um, they assume uh, Companies like Databricks, for example, assume that all of your functions are going to be inside the notebooks, which I said earlier, that's a horrible idea because it makes the notebook extremely unreadable. Uh, and notebooks are designed to be read. Code is designed to be, Python code is designed to be read more than written um, as a matter of Python programming philosophy. So why would you put, why would you hit your future reader with a wall of code? So um, one of the reasons why I did use Dask as well is because at least on the HPC system, it's shared file system. So my home directory where Anaconda is installed allows me to, um, and all of this custom source code that I'm writing is available to immediately to every single compute Dask worker. Um, so that was like one other really cool advantage um, in, in picking that. Yeah, the software, I mean, uh, it's interesting. There's like a lot of hype these days about the cloud. It's very exciting that you can do, you know, infinite scalability. You can burst really easily and cheaply, mm -hmm. really accessible. But a lot of the science groups we talk to have these HPC machines around, and they're just incredibly productive, right? Mm -hmm. They already have all the user management. They have the software distribution. They work well with you know native C, C plus plus codes. Mm -hmm. uh, like it's just a really it's a high productivity environment. It's only mm -hmm. really accessible if you are a company like Novartis, where they can purchase. You know, I don't know where you guys bought yours, but from IBM or from Cray or from HP. Something. Yeah. Um, and yeah, one of the really big benefits is moving around software environments is super easy. On the mm -hmm. cloud, it's really hard. Like, uh, so I mean, Coiled, we're working hard to make sure it's easy to run things on the cloud. Mm -hmm. And we spent about half of our time trying to figure out how to, as quickly as possible, you know, build environments, shift them to the clouds, make right. calls, build Docker images in a way that feels, you know, at most 20 times slower than what you're experiencing here. Right, right. Like we're, we have a ton of work to do to get to the point where we can make it feel as natural a system that you have in your yeah. on-prem HPC system. Right. Yeah. Even with that said, though, I'm, I'm looking forward to it, Matt. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's getting easier day by day. Uh, All right. Uh, background, uh, we actually had Eric uh, play with the engineers yesterday on Coiled. And like tons of things broke, uh, mm -hmm. we fixed most of those issues. Uh, but uh, yeah, no, it's it's replicating the laptop experience or the on-prem HPC experience in the cloud like requires actually a fair amount of uh, fair amount of grit. Maybe. Yeah, 
Yeah, I can imagine. I'm curious if we have a little bit of time to see a little bit more about your create DAS cluster function. You've hidden, I think, a little bit of how you create your clusters. Are yeah. you using like a DAS job queue library? Are you using DAS MPI? Are you rolling your own? Um, we use DAS job queue underneath the hood. Let me just see if I can like pull up the DAS cluster. Yeah. Uh, we have on the chat, we have uh, Anderson Benahue, uh, who, who helps to maintain uh, some of these um, libraries. I think there's the DAS job queue and a little bit of DAS MPI. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so Dask, Niber Dask is sort of like a custom library that we wrote, extremely lightweight. Um, we gave it to our colleagues. So this is one of those other things. We gave Niber Dask to our colleagues and showed them just a very simple code snippet that mirrored what you saw above on how do you create a Dask cluster and what to look out for. He immediately took it. And I, after only an hour of debugging something related to the operating system, uh, he was off doing extremely high performance genomics work um, for his department. It was amazing. And this is like when I say that we need like good software tooling and the likes. This, I didn't write. It was uh, an idea by one of my colleagues. Um, and all we did was just put in a bunch of same defaults that our HPC guys wanted us to do. So for example, we wanted that, they wanted us to make sure that we limited the wall time. Yeah. Um, they wanted us to, we, we had to make sure that we had like not too greedy of like memory GB per core. So we put in the same default over there. Um, we disabled GPU requests by default, but you can always re request it. Mm -hmm. um, we enable the ability to specify a Conda environment. So that's inside the, that we want. And, and that, that was, you know, that, that was a thing that we, had to do a bit of trial and error to get that right. Well, my colleague, Zach, actually, he's, he's another really big Dask user. And so, yeah, it's a bunch of like, it's a convenience function amongst a whole bunch of other convenience functions. I'm actually trying to nudge Zach or like, to use your words, Matt, nerd snipe him into uh, putting a PR into the Dask job queue or Dask libraries, just some of those functions that could be kind of user friendly for for end users beyond what this DAS cluster thing is. Yeah, that sounds great. So I see you, there you have a SGE cluster as your type. So you're running SunGrid engine, presumably internally. Yes, yes. We actually use Univa, uh, but it's the same thing. All okay. right. Same family. Great. So yeah, that's a, that's a little bit of that convenience function. Uh, it's fully tested. It is tested live on the HPC every commit as well. So we've got a We've got, it's pretty cool. Um, I like it. I like what we built there. There's a question in the chat from Dan Chen, who mm -hmm. said, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, uh, do you need to run this on a notebook or could you have run this script in a, in a Python script? Oh, I could have run it. Yes. I think yes. especially if you do, do you need like the if name equals main trick or anything or? Do you um, no, I think if, if I needed to put this inside a, a Python script, I would simply convert it to a, Python script in using NB convert and then execute the Python script right after. That would be pretty much it. Great. Do you do that sometimes? Is all of your work interactive or just sometimes do you go batch? Sometimes there are some notebooks which I, I, I that they start out, sorry, sorry, some scripts that start out as notebooks and I'm just trying to get it right. Um, and having the interactivity helps. And then when I'm ready to just execute it as is, then, um, it becomes, I convert it into a Python script, I delete the notebook and I version control the Python script and put it inside the scripts directory and that's it. Okay. And I use here, just let Dan Chen know, just let him know, I use here pretty often because you know I have directories, subdirectories all over the place. So PyProj root has been a lifesaver. My colleagues love it. Um, they really love it. It solves a really specific problem of like, dot, dot, slash something, or dot, dot, slash, dot, dot, slash something uh, <laughs> makes path resolution so much easier. OK, great. Hugo, is there anything else we should talk about? I, I think that's it. I just want to thank Eric and, and Matt once again for, for joining us. Um, this has been a, a wonderful trip into distributed compute and distributed machine learning uh, um, in the biological sciences. So thank you so much, Eric. Uh, my pleasure, Hugo. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Eric. Good to see you as always. All right. And thanks, everyone, for joining. 
Oh, right. and I, yeah. I'll give it. I'll give a quick shout out. Um, to next week we'll actually be. Um, we'll have Catherine Jamal, um, yeah. famed Pythonista, um, and uh, head of product Wait, at Kate Privacy. Why is she famed and I'm notorious? Um, pretty notorious herself too. I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I I find that a challenging question to answer. Let me. Let me just say. Why don't I just stop the live stream and save you that one, Hugo? How about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We can take yeah, that we, offline. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you offline. But next week, um, we're going to be talking about uh, distributed uh, uh, pri uh, privacy for, for machine learning and, and the need for distributed compute in order to do our privacy preserving um, and, and secure machine learning using uh, such packages as, as TF encrypted and a lot of stuff they're working on um, at, at Cape Privacy. Which we're super super excited about. Um, so let's once again um, thank the notorious e Eric Ma for, <laughs> for for his time, and and thank you Thanks everyone for joining. We'll see you next week. Bye everyone. Right.